A couple of months ago, I just decided I cannot watch the news anymore. It's just too negative and too anxiety producing. And, you know, I'm just like in a tizzy worrying about the midterms and everything. So I decided I'm just going to, you know, read hopeful literature. So, of course, I pulled off that John Lewis's first memoir, really of his early life and of the civil rights movement, Walking with the Wind. Um, many of you know a lot about Lewis's life. I've talked about him here quite a bit. He was born in 1940 in Pikes County, Alabama. His grandchild of slaves, his parents were sharecroppers, everyone around his little home were people he was related to. And it was a tough life, difficult life, impoverished life. Um, in some ways, reading his memoir makes me think of my mother because she was picking cotton in Texas about the same time. And, um, you know, same outhouse and all those experiences. But of course, she knew nothing of the violence of Jim Crow South. Um, but Lewis opens his book with a story, which is where the title of the book comes from, Walking with the Wind. He is four. It's 1944. It's during the Second World War. Um, but he knew nothing of the war. He'd hear the parents talking about it. But he just knew his little life. And it's a Saturday, and he's at the home of his Uncle Rabbit and Aunt Seneva. And they're playing outside, his siblings and cousins, maybe 15 kids, when a great storm comes up. And he was terrified of storms. He'd seen what lightning could do, how it could strike a haystack and then just set a whole field on fire, or how it could split a tree just right down the tube. And Aunt Seneva kind of grabbed all the kids, the 15, because this storm was coming up quickly. And they went into this little wooden house. It was very crowded in the house. And the wind was howling, and the rain was just pounding on the tin roof. And then the house began to sway. And, and, and just literally move. And then the floor began to buckle. And then the corner of the house literally began to lift up, the little wooden house. And it was like the wind was just carrying it to the sky. And so Aunt Seneva had all 15 kids take hands and walk over to the corner and hold it down. And then the other corner of the house began to lift. And so she had them take hands and walk over to that corner. And they, they, they did that back and forth, keeping the little house down throughout the storm. And he said that that image never left him. Sometimes he would be working on an issue in this country, and he would think about this country much like that little house, the foundation not quite holding, and how all the people in the movement wouldn't leave the house, but instead they would hold hands, walk together, and try to keep it steady. And he spent his entire life doing that. We lost him summer of 2020 at the age of 80, but his entire life was trying to build God's beloved community, trying to create a world where the lion and the lamb could lie down together, right? Where there would be no hurting or suffering. His whole life was like that. When he was 15, it was the Montgomery bus boycott. And he said, unlike any other event, that event actually totally changed his life. He decided he had to leave Pike County. He had to become a center of the movement, which meant he had to go to college. There was no money in the household for that. He wanted to go to Morehouse like Dr. King, who he'd heard about. But there was, his mother found a little flyer. She did wash as well at a Baptist home. And there was a Baptist college in Nashville, historically black school, that didn't have any tuition. You just worked and worked and worked as part of your tuition. And so in 1957, John Lewis went to Nashville, to this big city, right? And he learned so much, not just at that school, but if you've read his, you know, one thing he talked about over and over was on Tuesday nights there, they would go to this little Methodist church and Jim Lawson, you know, great leader, would teach these young students about civil disobedience and nonviolence and they would read Gandhi and Thoreau and Jesus and they would talk about what it means to practice nonviolence and they would do role play too. He talked about that a lot, how they would do what they called social drama. You'd pretend you were sitting at a lunch counter and some white teenager was beating you and you would not react. Instead, you would try to look at them with love. And so that group became really the core group of those sit-ins in Nashville. And that February of 1960, February 27th, was the first day a group of people, including John Lewis, was arrested, kind of knocked off his stool. And then that grew. It just kept on growing until May 10th, 1963, months later, the city of Nashville finally gave in and the department stores, the lunch counters were integrated. And reading that, it just, you know, it just makes my heart sore. You know, thinking about this person with so much vision and endurance and passion and courage. And then he goes into the Freedom Rides. And I just have to admit, it just gets, it's so much detail and it's so much violence that it's just really hard for me to stay with it. I mean, it's just, I just want it to end, I want it to be over. 
you know, hearing about 1961, that day in May when seven black kids and six white kids boarded a bus and they were challenging not just segregation in the buses, but segregation in the bus terminals, and their plan was to travel through the South and make it two weeks later into New Orleans. And the first couple of states were pretty uneventful, right? And then they got into South Carolina, and they got into Georgia, and the beatings, and the terror, and the violence, and the bombing of the buses, and the permanent brain damage, and the death that some people suffered. And to read about Bull Connor, and the sheriffs, and the police just holding their officers back while the Klansmen just attacked. And all the while, you had President Kennedy and Attorney General Bobby Kennedy trying to call it off because they weren't afraid that they couldn't protect these people. And then you read about them trying to go across Mississippi. Thirteen people on a bus took 1,000 National Guard, 42 vehicles, two helicopters, three airplanes to try to keep these young people safe. I mean, it's just, I just honestly, like, I'm not, I don't like to be hit or hurt, persecution, beating. I've been arrested once in my life, you know, it was with a few hundred people in Jefferson City and it was such a non-event, now I can't even remember if it was the minimum wage or Medicaid expansion. I don't even remember, right? But John Lewis was arrested 44 times in those first years of the 60s and he saw it not as something to be afraid of, but as something to embrace. He saw it as God's work. He talked about how exhilarated he felt, how elated on that first day, February 27th, 1961, when he was arrested for the first time. He said when that, they had been sitting there peacefully, quietly, and these white teenagers beating them, and the police came and arrested, of course, the people sitting at the counter for disorderly conduct. And he said when the police touched him, he just felt like his heart had broken open, and this is what he had been working for and moving for. He believed the whole empire was about to come down. And he said when they put him in that paddy wagon, for him, it was like a chariot coming for to carry him home. I mean, he just knew the empire was about to fall and he and his people would be lifted up. And he said the jail cell, filthy and cramped, was like this place of deliverance and freedom. And they sang and they prayed, we shall overcome. He saw the whole encounter as a way to show God's suffering love, as a way to put love in action, as a way to just look at someone who is beating him and hurting him as a precious child of God, to imagine them just this tiny little baby who had one day been so pure and innocent, and somehow he believed that they could be redeemed. He believed that unearned suffering would open the hearts of Americans, and in many ways it did, right? I mean, it's kind of been one of the things that people seen, you know, children bombed, killed in a, in a church, seeing dogs turning on people, that it did. The suffering really began to change and move this country. And still, I've got to admit, that's really hard and difficult, I think, for most of us to imagine that kind of suffering love, that kind of opening your heart to someone hurting you so much. But even though John Lewis could embrace that, he still struggled with the rejection he felt from his own family. His own family were more cautious, more careful, any of us who've been a parent, what do you want for your kid not to get in hurt? And for his parents, trouble was trouble. You know, he talked about getting into good trouble, but for them, it was shameful and disgraceful. And when he wrote his mother from that very first jail cell and said he'd been arrested, they rejected him, they pushed him away, and it said he, it caused a big rift in his family. He would still go home, but he felt uncomfortable and he felt as if they didn't understand him. That might be something about John Lewis that more of us can identify with, right? You know, that fear of putting out what you believe, saying what you believe, maybe commenting on someone's Facebook when it's particularly inappropriate, right? And, and just, I, I hear you honestly talking about that quite a bit. That was one of the reasons there was so much interest in the biblical fundamentalism is how do we, how do we stay in relationship with people who disagree with us? How do we not pull back, but how do we step out and offer up who we are, even if we're afraid of possibly being rejected by family and friends? Um, Garth Strand is someone who did that. He ran for election on Tuesday night, not at the top of the ticket, but like our own Nina Fricky, Garth ran for the state house out in Hutchinson in a very deep red area, and he ran as a Democrat. He ran for the very first time in 2020. 
He's 65 year old white guy, didn't need to put his picture up there because you can picture that, right? You know, he grew up in Western Kansas, been there in Hutchinson's for the last 43 years after he graduated from K-State. He was gonna be a teacher, but it was too hard to be a teacher, so he became a businessman, worked in credit unions. He decided in 2020 he would run because that was one of those seats that's always uncontested and there's just this incumbent who is pretty right wing, um, you know, NRA backed, all of that. And he felt like there had to be another alternative. He was an independent thinker, he was a moderate voter, he was fiscally conservative, probably be considered socially liberal because he believes in gun control and the rights of women and the rights of um, people to make their own decisions. And he got clobbered. And it wasn't just that he lost badly. I mean, that's kind of to be expected. It's very hard to win down ballot. I know from what my daughter does, you know, that in this district that's not colored like yours is, um, if you're red and blue, blue and red. Um, but the really difficult part was he felt so persecuted and attacked that it really strained relationships with friends and family, that people were kind of like, how could you even run? How could you even run as a Democrat? I mean, they were just like, and he was just shocked. And he was like, I will never do that again, never. It was so incredibly painful to feel attacked, to put your life out there. I mean, anybody who's ever run for public office or even, but it's a very, very vulnerable thing to do, right? To step up in a place that's so polarized and try to claim and try to share, even if you do like he did, a very positive campaign, a campaign that was really about unity and consensus and we can come together, never gonna do that again. And then when nobody else stepped up to run, he decided to run again. But this time he had the help of some good supporters like our own Bill Heatherman. Bill, I don't know if he's up there with us. Some days he's with us. He, he's the storm engineer. He's got a PhD in water and he's in charge of water in Manhattan. And when I met Bill in 2004, he was like in charge of water for the city of Overland Park. And I met him in 2004 at the John Kerry presidential headquarters on Warnell because my nine-year-old wanted to volunteer. And we went in there and Bill, who was kind of like the person who was always in the office, was so friendly and so welcoming that before long, you know, my daughter was not just making all the phone calls, she was training people to make the phone calls and then that's kind of been her path, right? But Bill met Garth after he lost in 2020 and he volunteered to help him and he started working on his website. And this time when Garth ran, I mean, he did it with more joy and more hope and more confidence. Um, he decided to just put out there real boldly what he believed and um, if you look at his website, the great part about it is like on the opening picture, the homepage, he's in a chariot of sorts. He's in a bicycle. It's a recumbent bike. It's one of those bicycles that kind of reclines. And he's got, looks like a homemade sign on the front that says something about freedom means respect and fairness and decency for all. And then he's got this big shirt that says, go with Garth. And he's got streamers behind him. And it's just this sense as if his paddy wagon became that chariot, right? as if he found a way by being upfront and clear, by sharing what he believed, to just to find a different kind of freeness, right? To find a different kind of freedom about who he was. And Bill made a really interesting comment to me. He said he thought in part the reason Kansas changed, he said the Dobbs decision. In some way, the Dobbs decision, a paddy wagon, right? In some way, he said, you know, that decision kind of took the state of Kansas head 10 years to the hearts and minds. Because before that, especially out there, you know, it was just yelling and screaming and there was just nobody would ever admit to the fact that people have abortions, people have reproductive, people need, and this decision was so shocking and so shattering that it really kind of forced people to stop and, and take a deep breath and think about human life is so difficult and so messy. And how do we make decisions when we really don't know how to go forward? How do we care for one another? How do we listen to one another? How do we offer compassion and care to one another? And he said, you know, Bill said he even, even had some conversations that he wouldn't have planned to have. Conversation with a family member that in 30 years he couldn't have imagined having. Being able to kind of speak deeply. And in that doing, in that kind of entering that paddy wagon, right, there becomes this way of taking the relationship forward. I mean, we all know that we all have relationships, right, where there's so much we can't talk about or so much we can't speak about, so much in our hearts we can't be honest about. And what does it do? I mean, it just starves the relationship, right? There's just not much energy or air there. So I'm thinking today about our own paddy wagons. I'm thinking about what are the things that we all need to do, that we all need to say. What are the resentments, the jealousies, the harshness maybe towards one or two people, 
that we need to sort of just step back, right? And try to just do our best to kind of reach out and see a person, see a person with love. You know, how can we find our own voice and how can we speak up and how can we share and how we can love as richly as we can? So with the saints like John Lewis and Garth Strand and Nina Fricke, may we all find our own way to live love, enduring boldly, confidently, believing ultimately that God will bring a new day, a new heaven and earth. Amen.